Welcome back to the third iteration of the Members Lounge. We're here, Andre, Christian, Dan, as usual. If this is your first time tuning in, thank you. If this is your second time, please make sure that you subscribe, like, comment once, comment twice, comment throughout the whole thing. Just like see how many times you can like comment. Like and subscribe. Yes, and uh, if you are new, we're at the Grand Cathedral Cigar Lounge, the number one cigar lounge in the entire world. The Mecca. The, the Mecca. Mecca. The Mecca of Tampa. So uh, one thing that I wanted to say major change here is we have a newly minted pepe coin millionaire <laughs> christian bonnier who some people are calling the next michael burry so can you tell me about the thought that went into this decision because i remember going into your room seeing graphs everywhere yep on the wall and just making this huge decision where you're like i'm gonna put everything i own in the pepe coin and i wish now i did actually here, so yeah no um i was just on twitter and some random account said buy this shit coin and i was like okay so i put in 500 bucks it's um, so simple and I was at, I'm at the same situation now I was at with Dogecoin two years ago where it tanked 50% from the all-time high. And last time, I sold all my Doge. So now, I'm not selling any of my Pepe. So if you're watching this, I'm either going to be really, really smart in a few weeks or I'm going to be really stupid. So stay tuned. <laughs> so wait, last time, looking back on it, we, you had a little bit of regret. Did you take any profits this time? Yeah, I, I, it all right? I took half out and I'm writing the last half. Okay, okay, smart respectable um other things this episode's going to come out in a few weeks with matt but andre and myself just completed a 48 mile challenge where we ran 48 miles over the course of two days andre was just talking to me earlier about how his brain at this point is pretty much mush. no brain cells left so for the if boys. you can form a sentence just what, what'd you go through this weekend sir <laughs> Scott was like, dude, why are you giggling for like an hour straight in your room today? I was on a Zoom call and I like, didn't know how to respond, so I just laughed. Um, my brain is just mush today, yeah. <laughs> they said that the 48 miles was the challenge. I'm telling you, the day after the challenge is the real challenge because like my brain is just not functioning today. Um, but I kind of miss it, dude. I do too. I'm like, as weird as that sounds. It was fun. It was a really cool experience. Um, and someone today uh, from or Dylan, our friend Dylan, texted me today asking about it, and he asked if I'd do it again. I 100 percent would. I think it'd be a cool opportunity to do it with like more guys in our friend group, because um, I just think it'd be a cool experience. Looking at Scott and also looking at Christian specifically, because Christian did not participate in this one. Um, so the stick talk crew is not fully represented as it should have been, but he was busy just charting the graphs, planning was, his next moves. With I was Pepe. busy long in Pepe, hundred X, bro. Took all my <laughs> full attention. No, and this same here. I did miss it in a weird way. Scott, what would it take? Time, for, what would it take for us to do it, bro? <sighs> just do it, bro. <laughs> Scott doesn't have a mic in front of him. He just I don't know. I honestly don't know. I would do a different challenge. I don't think I'd do the same one. I would do like a Spartan 10K or something along those lines. I feel like once, you, once you've done it, you've done it. You've kind of proved it to yourself. Let's just walk across the country. A little Forrest Gump? <laughs> Jesse you're, you're Hitzler. Re- so that's the thing, because Christian reminds me of Forrest Gump in a few ways. <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do a bike riding <laughs> challenge. Which, which, like, what's top of the ways? He's just, just special. Like, yeah. yeah. I'll do a bike riding guys. challenge. Let's bike, to fucking, let's bike to fucking... Jesse Hitzler is biking across America right now. That's based. Let's, let's bike to Miami. Classic. All roads lead back to Miami. All For roads lead back to Miami least. when you're a <laughs> degenerate. <laughs> when you're a Latino That's the Maxi. closest landmark I could think of. Oh, I biked to Orlando. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> I biked to Daytona Beach. Ma- Mickey Mouse Challenge. Um, but that's just something you know, completely outside of work. And I don't want to talk too much about the benefits because we'll cover it in a few episodes. But one thing that I did want to riff on a little bit um, was just our event that we had recently. And we did a podcast. It's it's on the channel. Released that. It's actually on Daniel's channel, I think. But I want to talk more about in person events and specifically from like a business owner's point of view. What, in your opinion, makes a good event? We'll start with we'll start with Andre, because you're usually the guy that actually pulled all the strings. <laughs> the puppet master. Yeah, I think first off, what makes a good event is the community that surrounds it, right? Um, Like, you could do all the theatrics, you can have all these guest speakers and this great agenda, but 
people aren't really going to get the full value unless they're surrounded by the right types of people. And I think I saw in the notes you talked a little bit about, we'll talk about like VCon and like, dude, like I love Gary and I love all the speakers and it's sick, but just look at the ticket prices for that event. Like it absolutely tanked because the people that go are NFT weirdos that like none of us want to hang out with. Like we experienced it last year. Like there were like two people from that conference that we could vibe with. And I'm sure there were more cool people. Segment of our audience. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not saying everyone, but you get the point, right? Like the community is is so disconnected compared to something like Client Ascension, where like all the guys when they meet in person for the first time at an event, they feel like they already know each other and they already like each other. And I'm not saying that it has to do specifically with NFTs or with Gary Vee, but I think smaller events are where you're going to find the most success. Um, it's just a little bit more friendly, welcoming atmosphere. And I mean, there's a lot of elements that going to conducting or hosting a good business event. But number one, I think the people that you bring there are key uh, because that's what leads to like all the experiences and stories outside of your agenda of like last event, we did a podcast. Like the podcast was cool, but like I guarantee you there are what, like 30 people in the room? Like maybe 10% of them walked away saying the podcast was their favorite part. Yeah. Yep. Right. <clears throat> Five eleven was definitely the favorite part for, for Bailey and Alex. That was a good time. Uh, but another thing that you hit on is just like keeping the group small. I think the biggest misconception for people is that they don't have a big enough following to throw an event. When in reality, even if it's a small get together and you're just doing whiteboard shit, you're doing a, a workshop and having 10 people, especially if you're in a client services business, that's so, so important because we kind of came up in the age where like we've never met a lot of our employees. We've never met a lot of our clients. So go the extra mile to actually meet these people in person. It's just going to make that bond way stronger. Obviously, it's going to help with, you know, ROI positive things like retention. But more importantly, it's just going to make everything you do a lot more enjoyable because you're not just looking at people anymore as characters on a screen. You get to know them on a deeper level. Um, another question yeah, I, I was. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I was gonna, <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna like, stay on the same topic. But I was just gonna say I think the biggest part of a successful event is not to have an agenda behind it. I feel like a lot of the in-person meetups at the end, the guy gets on stage. He's like, "If any of this was valuable, who's ready to join me in the back-end mastermind?" And like, I don't. That's just kind of a. Was that like a Tony Robbins impersonation? Sli no, I don't. <laughs> slimy, slimy play to me. Um, I think just having an event for the sake of community building and making friendships and forming relationships with. Students, you know, other people in the program, I think that's what it's all about. Like, we didn't have an agenda behind it. We just had a meetup, and I got to make, you know, a lot of really cool connections with people in our community um, that transcend beyond just a Slack group now where I can, you know, text them and feel like they're a close friend of mine. Whereas if it's only over the Internet, it's a little bit harder to form that, that connection and, you know, really have that bond. So I think that was the best my favorite part of the event and definitely what makes a good event you're saying like no agenda like not trying to sell them something right yeah, like you're not we had nothing to sell we were just okay. hosting an event you know because i was like bro like you still have to kind of plan it out like what you want to do no right? yeah 100 percent. but i'm just saying there was no uh we weren't trying to monetize it we just had an event yeah we basically. literally did it for free yeah obviously the caveat is that these guys paid already to be in our program and that's a way for us to build more brand loyalty with the people that already bought in but at the same time, we're not trying to further sell them first on the front end for with a ticket because it's free or on the back end with now that they're there, let's try to get them on something else. It's just a super genuine event. And I think people felt that as well, which yep. is why we got a lot of positive uh, feedback. When we run it back, when's the next one? I want to do monthly, but we so this is the, one of the main talking points at the event because it was business related. So there was a lot of strategy uh being talked about and one of the I, my biggest takeaway or what i thought the biggest theme of the event especially talking to the people there was market research and going out and talking to your customers and like how to build a really good product and so like i doubled down on that by after the event i created a type form and sent it to people who went and i'm like yo what do you think what would you rate the event what do you rate the food what do you rate the venue what do you rate the agenda did you do that already yeah we, how'd it go it's good. That's what I'm getting, that's what I'm talking about. Um, so there were like five or six responses from some of the guys that attended and it was really cool feedback. And one of the questions was how often should we have these events monthly, quarterly, yearly? And like, I want to do a monthly because they're so much fun 
right? Um, but like a majority of the responses were quarterly. And that makes a lot of sense because for us, it's really straightforward. We just go up a few floors in our apartment building because that's where we host them. Yeah. And then we come here, which we're already here multiple times throughout the week. So it's really easy and convenient. But everyone else, they're flying in from different cities. They're, you know, paying money to stay in hotels, stuff like that. So quarterly makes sense. But yeah, I think sometime in the next month or two, for sure, we want to do another one. Definitely. Definitely. Um, you kind of touched on it when you talked about how you don't like when people have a huge call to action at the end of a speech or something. Um, but my next question was going to be, as an attendee, what do you guys look for in business events? I know that we're signed up for Russell Brunson's later in the year, but are there certain things when you're looking at a potential event to go to? Like if somebody's out there watching and they're trying to figure out, okay, is this event bullshit? Is it actually going to be applicable to what I'm doing? Like what do you look for from an attendee's perspective? I would say access to high level people mm. <clears throat> like Andre got to sit down with Patrick, Brett, David and really Rudy Giuliani after um, their podcast and smoke a cigar with them. Like we met Gary V briefly at VCon. We were around some high level people. Um, I think the social aspect and being able to network with a lot of high level people is what I look for in a business event. Um, and then just being able to meet other people in the space and partner with them, follow them on social media, you know, potentially work with each other. I'm a, I say it all the time. I'm a very big, I'm, I like the social aspect of a lot of things. So being yeah. able to sit down, smoke a cigar with people, you know, make new connections, um, meet some, some high level people is really what I look for in an event more so than the content of it. Yeah. Andre? I'm not like, I can't recall like an event or a moment at an event where I'm like, dude, that keynote or that piece of content was game changer. Except for like Dickie Bush. <laughs> Except for Dickie Bush at our own event. Yeah. Cause that was like an absolute masterclass, but I feel like keynotes in general, like, they feel good in the moment, and they're cool, and they're motivating. Yeah. But for me, like, I've been to enough events. Like, I went to Grant Cardone's event, 10X Conference. I went to VCon, Gary Vee's event. We've hosted a bunch of our own events. We've been to – I've been to a lot of business networking events. And, like, what I've found is I, I usually get excited for the people speaking. Like, even at VCon last year, like, there's this whole list of speakers that I, I think in my head I'd like to hear from. But then I sit down, and I'm like, this is not – where the real opportunity is the opportunity yeah. is in everyone else sitting next to me and being able to network and find um you know value that way especially when we went to um what was the one we went to in portugal web summit web, web summit. summit yeah same thing like there are all these like billionaire tech ceos and entrepreneurs like speaking on stage and i think we went to like two or three sessions and they were good yeah but, like, that was not really what we were there for. And like Christian said, dude, like, events are so fun because of the experiences. Like, the best part of that event, to me personally, <laughs> was definitely the the bubble waffle. Yeah. Kinder Bueno Nutella <laughs> crepe. Ooh. Still, like, the best dessert I've ever had. <clears throat> I think about it all the time. Um, <laughs> and then also the satellite events. I think, like, the yeah. satellite events. Like, yeah. you mentioned, or you mentioned, like, the f going to 5.11 the next night after our event with some of the guys. Yeah. Like, things that happen that branch off or outside that of the core event. Connor and David was fun, too. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say that was my favorite part of that, so like, that trip. That's, that's what I enjoy the most is, like, the experiences that happen outside of the event. Cowboy Jacks. Cowboy Jacks. Shout out to that <laughs> bar in Minneapolis. But, yeah, I think the satellite events are great. The networking opportunities. Again, I never really take away anything crazy from the content. Bro, like VCon, some of my favorite moments were just like us messing around, like walking to the venue. Like us and Max just, I don't know. Yeah, I was going to say that the main thing I would recommend people do is to go with a group. It's just a fun thing to do. Like if you have even like one or two other friends that are interested in business, ask them to go, yeah. go to an event. You guys are going to have a good time. Just make, make a trip out of it. Bro, the, the funniest, this is a great example, actually. Like, we went to Web Summit, and I'm pretty sure, I, I think you were, like, selling. You were, like, actually making use of the event ticket by pitching at the booth. Christian and yeah. I literally found, like, a co-working space booth <laughs> in the event and just sat there all day and worked. Not all day, but yeah. <laughs> but for work. the most part, dude, I spent most of my time at the conference working, like I would have from a hotel room or from my home office. So, again, like, I just think outside of the event, there's the real opportunities i talked to a minimum 100 people there <laughs> such a different world than the one that we're used to that's all like nobody has any money everybody's looking for funding nothing's profitable but everything's like the next meta <laughs> like 
not no, and it's that's where like yeah. the unicorns come from. Usually, it's just it was different. It was a change of pace for sure. And then the only other thing I wanted to say for events, I feel like that's like the weird item where always take the upsell. I like with the Patrick oh, Red yeah, David podcast dude. event. There's no better thing to spend extra on than at an event just pay access. for that higher level access yeah access i was that was gonna be my other thing is like if i go to an event like going forward like i would advise against the lowest tier ticket like i want to pay for access if that's there's an option like vcon there's one ticket so you can't but like, like with, day, yeah like, with the sales event you didn't get it you didn't get the higher one you're like shit i didn't even know because yeah i didn't even know there was page. there yeah. i was 100 like 100 percent it's the most valuable way to do it. Our friend Brandon that goes to like all the events, he said the same thing after going to like a hundred business events. Yeah. There's no point of just going like buy the highest access ticket and go to 10 instead of a hundred. Yeah. And it's has nothing to do with getting that close to the person. Cause odds are their plate is super full. You're probably not going to do business with them. Like if you get the highest tier ticket at a Gary V event, you're yeah. still probably not going to conduct business with Gary V, but you're surrounding yourself with all those other people who firmly believe in investing with themselves and then also that's why have i think the vcon audience is so weird because the tickets Unless like you bowl strike bucks. with gary v yeah huh you see that gary v had like his bowling event where all the nft holders could bowl with him and some kid was like awful and gary's or he's like if i bowl a strike here invest in my business and gary's like 25 grand he bowls a strike <laughs> <laughs> and that's sick and that ticket is like twenty thousand dollars or that nft specifically yeah. that gets you access to go bowling with gary yeah. v so like that's a specific subsect of the community where I feel like it'd be valuable. But like VCon, it's so different because it's like a hundred dollars to get in. So like anyone can get in and there's no tiered access at all, which I think is a mistake. See, I want to talk about that because we're all going to VCon. That's in Indianapolis in a couple of weeks. If anybody by any chance has Indianapolis tips, cool place to go, hit us up, please. Bro, we, uh, got Dylan to, we got Dylan to plug us up. Oh, true. <laughs> true. Matt uh, Moore lived there. He said there's nothing. Yeah, he's, really? he was well, like, I mean, Dylan's brother-in-law is like the god of Indianapolis. So. Yeah, but it's probably a different experience being yeah. the star of the NFL team versus versus a 20-year-old that, you know, is just trying to figure life out. Uh, but anyways, the tickets right now are like $160. And there's like an Andrew Schultz stand-up event. There's a bunch of high-level speakers. It's extremely, extremely cheap. You mentioned earlier it's because the community is a bit weird Dis uh, i honestly think it's because it's the fact that it's an nft the ticket and that market is so so cold and the amount of people that would just pay 500 bucks if it was just a regular ticket it's like hey here's the ticket to go would be oh, way yeah, more sure. than the amount of people so it's for like sure. the fact that it's an nft is well, i just think it's because it's it. a bear market and all the nft bros are like poor now but like he's saying think about if gary if just, just announced his audience yo i'm hosting this super conference with this lineup of speakers 500 dollars a ticket Everyone would yeah, buy. Yeah, if you put on Eventbrite, he could sell it for 500 to to 1000 easy. Andrew Schultz tickets go for like 300 400 That's right what now. I was saying. Andrew Schultz tickets alone make it worth yeah. it. Yeah. And he sells out every show. Yeah. That's interesting. I wonder why that is. Maybe because the, the ticket market is fluid. It's not like a static price, and it's just like the market's demanding it. The mark, Well, that's the, exactly what it is. It's the people, the tickets were never sold. The tickets were given but to imagine, people. So people that go to an event, I'm sure there's a percentage that spend the 500 and say, oh, this isn't worth it. So yeah. now those people with the ticket can now say this is only worth 160 and then the floor just fluctuates. Yeah. But, but think about it this way. is like the tickets were never sold in the first place. They were airdropped to the 10,000 people that bought the original NFT, and yeah. all those people are down bad, meaning they probably can't afford flights or hotels in Indianapolis. So they're like, I'm just going to sell it for 100 bucks, And then it just sets the floor. So, like, Gary's not setting the price at all. It's the market. And yeah. that's why it's an interesting... I, I agree 100%. Like, for an event like that, if Gary's, like, trying to... I'm not sure what his motive is, but if he's trying to, you know, make a bag, then, yeah, sell it as just a ticket. That's what I'm NFT. saying. It's such a bad use case for this that it's literally devaluing the event. Mm -hmm. It's like, picture a big Venn diagram, and one circle is people that have money, and another circle is people that know how to use OpenSea, buy an NFT. It's like the overlapping part is getting smaller and smaller and smaller whereas like two years ago three years ago like everything was great and they'd spend well seven, i think his whole i think his ticket. whole i think his whole vision is like he's gonna be the guy that started nft events you know like he sees it long term i guess but I the know. speaker lineup is moving away from web3 as well quite a bit going just back in the regular business but his whole thing from now on is v friends you know I think he could have done a cool thing where it's just, it could still be an NFT. I just think he needs to sell it from the get-go rather than drop it to 10,000 people and let them sell it for whatever they want. 
that's really the issue. It's just like saying, bro, like my followers, there's 33,000 Twitter followers. Here's a free ticket to my event. He's also hosting them in terrible cities. Like no one wants to go. <laughs> that's true. That's like, true. Put it in Miami or New York City. It's probably but way I, more. I was looking. I think it was five. I think I bought mine for like 550 for Minneapolis. Yeah. And then they tanked right before because people that can't go start selling them and then they're dirt cheap. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but enough of NFT talk. I was just interested to hear if you guys thought like that market for like real life utility is completely dead. Hell no. 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 I was having the same conversation with Christian. That's the whole future of NFTs is utility like that. Exactly. If Gary's like, I mean, he already has the NFTs and the ones that give access to him in person are a lot of money still. Yeah, like the bowling one. Yeah. And I put out a tweet about this that got a, a lot of really good feedback. And I don't see really anyone talking about this. But the reason to buy NFTs is not to get a return on your investment. It's the utility of... It's not to flip it. Yeah. It's access. It's literally an easy if way Gary to get said access. I'm dropping an, a 10 NFT with 10 NFTs in the whole collection. And anyone that holds it can go to a Super Bowl party with me at the stadium. I'm buying it. Yeah. Not to try to flip it and make money, to but go. to literally go yeah. to the Super Bowl with Gary Vee. And this happened recently... That's how Dan and I got to go to the, the Heat playoff game with Ty Lopez with, like, four other people. Yeah, that's the exact, yeah. And then also I went to Ta Tom Brady's retirement party in Tampa. Like, that's all from NFTs. So I just look at NFTs more as, like, access, not an invest. I'm not going to put money in and say 10 years later I'm going to flip it for profit like I would with a stock or something, personally. Yeah. That's, that's kind of my question, though. Why not just sell tickets to Tom Brady's retirement party or the Heat game with... Ty Lopez. He could. It's just, I guess, for them, I, I don't know the business model, really. I think they make more money from having a marketplace of collectibles. It's like a they they layer in the collectability aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, because after the, I'm sure the Tom Brady NFT is still worth money. If you host an event and everyone pays 500 the next day, no one's buying your Eventbrite receipt for 100 throw it bucks. out. So the NFT, but now the NFT, the Tom Brady could say, "Oh, I'm having a party in five years. If you own this, you can come again." It's like yeah. bang. It's, and every time it changes hands, they get royalties. Yeah, right? exactly. Okay, okay, fair point. All right, so we're a bit on the fence about NFTs. You guys seem to think they still have some future, but you mainly can sell in the your VCon NFT for the last one for the, probably the same price you bought it right now. Yeah, I checked. They're like. 250 bucks right now. I'm going to sell my v VCon one ticket to get a VCon two yeah, ticket. Yeah, so I, th I think for sure there's value. I think people look at NFTs the wrong way of like, yo, what's the project <laughs> I could buy and flip for double my ETH? Yeah. Which was how it was in the very beginning, like with any new market, like yeah. with Pepe. <laughs> like, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. You're saying we're not going to the moon? Oh, are oh, we're we? still going to the moon. We are? Pepe's going to the moon, bro. I oh, think so, bad. too. Hold um, on all of it. Another example, back in the day, I dabbled in some stupid nfts but one that really caught my attention was this project's whole utility was anyone that holds this nft also the only thing they did with the money from the nfts was buy up airbnbs and anyone with the nft could get a really discounted rate on the airbnbs in the collection thought that was cool that is pretty cool yeah yeah there's definitely utility with with nfts it's just the the weird phase of like most of the people were in it for the wrong reasons in the beginning and it's dragging down the entire market for right now yeah, I mean, we're also thinking in a very short window. It's been like two years since they went viral. That's yeah. true, man. So much shit has happened in these past two, three years. Crazy to think about. Anyways, I wanted to talk about something I've been seeing on Twitter quite a bit. Hasbulla is in jail? Hasbulla is in jail. We'll, we'll talk about that first. So he's recently just got arrested for what? traffic violations. Yeah, he got arrested today for traffic violation. So free Hasbulla. What? Free my man, bro. No way. I swear to God. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably what he said. <laughs> no, no, please. <laughs> Yo, that's crazy. Are you serious? Yeah, dude. He's in jail. What? <laughs> they just put him in a whole dog In a Russia, Russian jail. He's dead then. He's, He's not dead. He's not dead. He's like the king over there. It's like Putin and then... His jail cell is probably a freaking luxury suite with a bunch oh, it's of a cats. It's a dog crate. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Please, no, uh, bullshit. no, but to get to the actual topic, uh, I was gonna wear my Hasbulla shirt, but I wore it for the last two one. Yeah, podcast. that's that's the only shirt he wears for 80% of the days. Good thing I have two more coming in. <laughs> <laughs> what was that like? Can we drop the affiliate Hasbulla link in the description? I mean, it's here? a full send, another utility of NFTs. I got 30% off my order with my full send NFT. <laughs> you have a what's what's the NFT called? Metacard. Metacard. Have you done anything with it? 
Um, I got 100 bucks in Happy Dad store credit, and I've got 30% off a couple shirts. So recouped about 150 bucks of my $700 investment, and the NFT is worth 500 So That's the cool thing, though. You'll have it forever. But tomorrow, they could be like, hey, we're hosting an event in Tampa. You can come if you own the NFT. I can go. Yeah. Shit. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, summer's coming up, boys. So I wanted to talk about work-life balance. And I know that we're all going to be traveling quite a bit. We're going to be out of town for most of the summer, all going to different places. So what are your thoughts on just, like, seasons? Do you guys try to keep it consistent, like work the same amount each week, or do you find yourself just kind of, like, diving, doing 20 hours of work, kind of being antisocial, and then going on the full end, the opposite end of the spectrum? If we were still living in New York, the summer would be definitely a more distraction, but we're in Florida, bro. It's always summer. I was going to say it's always summer here, bro. (laughs) Always summer. Good point. But I get I guess you're saying like yeah. for other people like in your life it starts be- to become like more active. Yeah. Of like things going on. I mean my hometown will be infinitely more fun than it was in December and during the winter, that's for sure. That's what I'm saying. Speak from the perspective of somebody who lived in upstate New York where it's kind of just like you're a groundhog just <laughs> underground for five months and you finally come up, you got the sundresses out, a bunch oh. of events, barbecues. Oof. So you're saying how would I manage it? Yeah, how would you manage it? I mean, I would probably, I'm weird. Like, if I don't have any commitments all day, I'll just drag my workout over the whole course of a day. But if I have something at 4 p.m., I will work very much more focused up until 4 p.m. and probably get more done in that period until 4 than I would if I worked the whole day with nothing, no deadline. So regardless, you're working the same amount per day? Getting the same amount done, probably. Yes. Okay. Interesting. Do you find that you're the same or when you're super social, are you less productive? Oh, dude, I can't work around people. Like, Well, no, just like cutting your day off. No, I, I agree. But I'm saying like 100% what he said. And that, that goes for anyone, though. If you give yourself a deadline, you're going to be way more productive. Like your actions are going to change. Yeah. So if you just have a blank day on your calendar with nothing going on, it doesn't mean you can't be productive. It just means you have to structure your day and like make It's more those. of a leisure, though, you know? It's like, oh, I got to get these things done. I'll work, go to the gym, come back. Work well, it night. can be, but it could also just be the same exact effect. You could say by noon, I want to have all these things finished. True. And then you could say by 4 p.m., I want to have all these things finished. Like, M. Milet talks about how he has, he has, like, he, he divides his day into three days. Yeah. And that's how he can stay ahead of every other entrepreneur because he literally works three days a day. Because that's what he does. He yeah. literally creates face, fake um, timelines or deadlines for every single one of his days, even though it's not like he has an obligation to go somewhere. He just does it because... That's how humans are more effective. We got a live audience. <laughs> and the fish. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think if you, you could, you could do that in, in different ways. How do you set deadlines for yourself effectively? If you have no, if you have no boss, let's say you run your own business. <laughs> Bro, you have to. I mean, that's how you end up getting paid. Um, I think in the beginning, it's definitely a lot tougher as like an entrepreneur because You have to, you're like the last line of defense, essentially. Like it all falls back on you. So like if you don't get your work done, like no one's going to punish you, but you're also not going to get the reward. Um, And I think first you have to like taste the reward to really understand it. And then when you start to slack off and you don't get that same reward, like we've seen it. We've had months where the business is crushing and then we have months where it just tanks. And then it's like kind of a realignment of like, someone's not telling us we have to do something differently, but we all know what we want. And so we're going to change our actions to get it because we know how to get it. So that's what I would say is like, just what do you want? Deep. Yeah. Just ask yourself what you want and then plan your day around that. I don't know. Like, I guess like more practical ways of going about it is literally just like every single day when you get to your computer, just write down the things you want to accomplish. Yeah. Yeah. Really just goes back to effective goal setting and oh bro, what's his outputs. name? So when we were at the event with Ty Lopez, yeah, he actually explained this in a really cool way. Okay, he said he lives each of his days like the seasons. Did you did he catch this? Yeah, I did. So he was like saying like in the morning that's springtime for me, and he like had a bunch of things that he does in the springtime that you typically do, and then he's like in the middle of the day it's summer, and then you do a bunch of stuff that you do in summer, and then at the end of the day it's winter. Or, or fall. Fall or, comes next, yeah. yeah whatever. <laughs> and then, we, I forget all the seasons now that we live in Florida. And then his nighttime is, is winter. 
And so he was explaining, like, he would categorize his day in the four seasons, and each season had different focuses, whether it's uh, time in solitude, like time to yourself, whether it's time around other people, creating content, meetings, sales calls. And so depending on which, like, answering slacks and emails. And so plan your day in, like, chunks. That's what I like to do. Yeah. Like, I found myself, if I try to create content in the morning, it's it, no go. Yeah. I only can create content at night because that's Same. when like the creative part of my brain is more active. And so in the morning, all I'm doing is just ripping through Slack DMs and emails because it's more of like an autopilot yep. type work. I'm the same. And so I want to get all my Slack and emails done in the morning. And so that's my deadline. It's like I don't have all day to get through Slack and email because second part of my day is going to be content. And so yeah. I have to get this done to be able to do my content. So that's how I look at it. Anything to add? I'm sir? the same way. I'm way more creative at night, so I don't really like to... I mean, I write threads in the morning once in a while, but sales assets, long form, always at night. Gotcha. Okay. I feel like one thing we haven't discussed, and correct me if I'm wrong, is kind of the future of this podcast. And haven't done, like, the more generic, you know, questions that a lot of people talk in the first episode since... Go back to episode one if you want to see the man behind the camera, Scott Millard, good-looking fella. Uh, but Are where you do guys, like, brothers or something? Yeah, I mean, in the right setting. <laughs> that's in the right setting. He must Jesus in, the, in the right setting, that's my brother who's trying to move down to Tampa. <laughs> and we're trying to convince him. How do we convince him? It, it just works every <laughs> time, bro. They're like, oh, come to Tampa. <laughs> Wait, what? Huh? What? Is this an inside <laughs> Christian's like, I want in on this. <laughs> Dude, this is just every time we, every time I've ever gone to a bar with Scott. And if we're trying to, you know, be, oh, you if we're brothers? trying to be a Riz dev, we just... Say we're brothers, and he's. I'm trying to convince him to move to Tampa. That's a that's a good one. Works every time. You got to pull all the gimmicks. I get it. <laughs> the gimmicks, bro. You're the king of gimmicks. Uh, <laughs> but seriously, like my son Chris. <laughs> let's start. Let's start with this immediate future. Not immediate because we want to do this for a long time. But like this year, do you guys have specific guests that you would like to get? Specific milestones that you would like to hit? Just gonna open it up real general. PBD, Patrick De Bad David would be awesome. Definitely uh, a guy who we look up to in a business sense, and then also just what he's doing with Value Team. Man, I feel like he's just he does content the right way. It's growing super quickly, so the results show for itself. Anybody else that comes to mind? Not particularly. I want to interview like a pro athlete at some point. I think that'd be really cool. That would be dope. What would you ask? A, like, why? Why do you want to interview a pro athlete? Just to hear their, I think professional sports and business have a lot of parallels with like Kobe Bryant's a perfect example, like discipline, work ethic, mindset, um, maybe how they've expanded into business outside of being a pro athlete, talking about how they handle success and wealth and fame. I think it'd be very interesting. Yeah, I agree. I would also like to interview a high level college athlete right now. College athlete? Just because NIL money is a... Any Thanks. twins that come to mind? <laughs> if the Cavender twins are watching, please. The who? Get back to my DM. The Cavender twins? The Cavender? ones who play Miami basketball? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, uh, dude, no, they're Super just. Super talented. They're yeah. just really good at basketball. So talented. Look, you done. The final four. Quit hating. How about you, though, Andre? What? Any specific guests that you have on the radar? <laughs> like, Any specific what? goals you want to hit? I'm taking it one episode at a time, man. Yeah. That's my biggest thing, dude. Like, with Real Talk university our, our first ever podcast like when we started we had no idea what we were doing <laughs> like ab like literally no bro, the idea. incubator episode is goaded bro the first ever episode christian and i were like yo let's start a podcast i remember we met in like the study lounge at your uh residence hall yeah. in bu remember that we spent like three hours trying to find somewhere to do it yeah <laughs> that could have been clipped so weirdly. <laughs> in his residence hall, we spent three hours trying to find somewhere to do it. Um, the podcast. Pause. <laughs> Pause. <laughs> My brain is mush right we now. We ended up sitting on the other side of Incubate or uh, what's the cold calling agency? Bandelier. Bandelier. Band yeah, we sat at the opposite ends of Bandelier. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll go into the story. So basically, we planned the episode. We've never done a podcast before ever. We had barely any idea on how it worked. I've never even heard myself like speak on a like outside of my own voice you know yeah. what i'm saying like it's weird to hear yourself yeah. talk um but literally we went into like an office space and we took like these sales headsets and christian went to one end i went all the way to the other end 
and then we like joined the same Zoom call and we just started talking and it's so weird. I think it was bro. on Skype. <laughs> like we Zoom went wasn't, all the way. Bro, Zoom was barely a thing back then. We were on Skype. We were using <laughs> we were using Skype, bro. That's when crazy. Zoom got popular during COVID, we're like, we've been <laughs> yeah, on Zoom, do, bro. Do, do, do. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was crazy. We had no idea how to do a podcast. That was our first episode. And then we just did random interviews. Um, and it ended up being this huge thing that led to us discovering cold email. It led to us getting to do interviews in Gary Vee's Bro, I just had office. A, I just had an idea. My, all right. This is a goal and an input that I'm going to start doing. Let's land a guest that we got through cold email. Let's just reach out to each, each of us do 10 a week and reach out to high level people until we get one. If we have to travel there, we have I've to been travel saying there. this, bro. Let's do it. I've been saying I'm this. like, wait, how do we get so many guys on Real Talk? Oh, yeah, we, we cold emailed everybody. DMs every single day. So we'll have to travel somewhere, but hopefully land a big... Yeah, well, but you fumbled that. Yeah, my biggest thing to, to, to finish that point, I guess, is like when Real Talk University started the podcast, like we had no idea where it was going. And like this, like we could say, oh, yeah, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to get this guy on, that guy on. But like it's just one episode at a time. Is really all it is. Yeah. And then a year from now, who should have asked Glenny Balls to come on. Who knows, man? Just literally take it one episode at a time. And that goes for everything. Like, even yeah. in business, is just take it one day at a time in business. Like, you're not, if we set these crazy business goals, we've done this before too. You, everyone's done it where you set like some crazy goal and then you look back a year later and you're like, I even look back at goals I set at the beginning of this year of like things that I wanted to focus on or do. And I'm like, why did I set that again? Like, it's changed so dramatically. Yeah. So I just try to focus more on like short term, which yeah. is kind of the contrarian because all the gurus are like, what's your 10 year plan? I'm like, I don't, I don't fucking know. Yeah. I feel like that's my main goal is just get through the year without missing a single week. And so yep. far we're 20 something strong. On point. Yeah. Input goals. Yeah. One episode a week. Um, send a bunch of DMs to try to get cool guests. That's really it. Yeah. yeah. My only thing I had to add to that was just getting in touch with high-level people in the area because I think that's one of the really cool things about running a podcast is the the network that you can grow from it. Mm -hmm. So don't even really have aspirations of, like, traveling mm. to interview a super high-level guest, which would be cool. Uh, it's more so about talking to community leaders. Oh, like one when thing you said, I want to do? Wait, sorry. I, I yeah. completely just keep going. No, it was like <laughs> when, when you said pro athletes, like, it'd be sick to interview Steven Stamkos. Mm. or you know the owner of the biggest restaurant group in the area just things along those lines but yeah go ahead. i was just thinking it'd be dope to do like a, a one-year anniversary of stick talk and invite all of the past guests and do like kind of like a live show that would be, be dope. pretty sick that's, that's so not a bad idea things like that just like things we can actually control and, and do like without having reliance on some outside force it's like oh i want to get to 10k subscribers by the end of the year like I'm just one person, so I can't control the other 9,999 that need to subscribe. Like, they will when they do. We can just keep put. <laughs> yeah. Subscribe just, right now. Subscribe let's right just go now. To the, let's just go out one night and just our only incentive is just to get people to subscribe to the show. We'll just have, like, 2,000. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the your only, only incentive. incentive. Yeah. <laughs> Why is there always a, there's always a hidden meaning behind the shots? I Christian it pops up on the next episode with, like, three Rolexes on. <laughs> Each arm. <laughs> <laughs> the fucking Pepe millionaire. I mean, I was sitting down at a bar at Small Giant, and I got some girl to subscribe to the show, so. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm ba my back hurts, bro. <laughs> That's why. We were talking before the show. I'm like, I looked at YouTube stats, and it was like 90% men, 10% females. So I was like, who are the females that are watching? A subscriber's a subscriber, dog. What do you want me to do? The 10% uh, no, is I'm higher just than curious. I expected. I'm like, where are they coming from? And then I just hear you're out recruiting, so it makes sense. We've got to get a female guest on at some point. We do. Do you have anybody in mind? Mm. Danica Patrick? Aaron Scott's Andrews. Like Aaron Andrews, yeah. Wifey. That's a good one. I'm trying to think of an influential female in Tampa. Aubrey Strobel. <laughs> Aubrey Strobel, she's she's big in the crypto. She'd be cool. She lives in Tampa. No, but she seems cool. Oh, that's <laughs> Kathy. Doesn't Kathy Wood uh, have a headquarters in Tampa now? Yeah, at uh, St. Pete. Who's Kathy Wood? The Ark. Ark. Ark Investment. Oh, like huge. Yeah. Yeah, she's huge. Yeah, yeah. She's like a billionaire hedge fund. Let's that's get Vinnick on, and then he can connect us. Jeff Vinnick, the goat. R.I.P. the Lightning this year, though. Sad ending. 
Sad. <laughs> Go Bolts. So sad. Speaking of... Got trolled for that, just like everything else. Yeah, yeah, it's all right. We went down. The whole ship went down together. But speaking of sports ball, we've got uh, the NBA playoffs going on right now. We actually have both of our favorite teams here. Me and Andre are Heat fan. Christian's a Warriors fan. And right now, you're going up against the greatest player of all time. So are you nervous? At, at the time of this recording, it's 2-1. Game four's on tonight. What's your prediction? So we can clip this and show everybody you were wrong. Champions are going to do what champions do. They're going to bounce back. Are you talking about LeBron? He's, he has four rings. The guy with also four rings, Steph Curry, is going to bounce back. Okay. Curry's got four rings, too. Mm-hmm. Damn. Yeah. But the ones with KD. Are I was right. going to say, he got ah, carried. Yeah. He got I mean, carried LeBron has by won in the freaking Iguodala. Who else won MVP in, in some of those other? KD. KD. Who Just else? Just KD and Iguodala. He's, Curry's got one. But who won? So who won? It was two? Iguodala, KD, 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 Curry. Okay. So he got carried. So he really he has one ring. But okay. So yeah, the, the one in the bubble doesn't count either then. Why? LeBron yeah. won MVP in the bubble, no? That was an, that was an AAU tournament, dog. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't say that no fans makes it Okay, but you equal. can't say Curry's the GOAT. He's got four rings, when one NBA he's the MVP. Goat, bro? When did I say he's the GOAT? <laughs> I said he had four rings. I said it a fact. That's not even an opinion. It's a fact. Okay, but you said he's a champion. Like he is LeBron a champion. is not a champion. LeBron um, is the champion. I'm saying Steph Curry is a season vet. He's a champion. He's going to do what champions do, and he's going to bounce back. If LeBron was down 3-1, I'd be like, champion should bounce back. And he did when he won in Game 7. But the, the Lakers are winning, so I don't need to say he has to bounce back because there's nothing to bounce back from. All right, we're just gonna, we're going to stick with pop culture here. The newest Oppenheimer trailer came out, and we're all big Christopher Nolan guys. Scott, behind the camera, also a huge Christopher Nolan guys. He is Christopher Nolan. Dude. He what is Chris, about? He's Christopher Nolan. Chris Nolan. Chris Nolan. <laughs> Before he was Christopher. Uh, what's your favorite Nolan movie? Interstellar, for sure. Really? Yeah. Over Dark Knight? Yeah. <laughs> that's tough. <laughs> Dude, like, that's for sure for me, Interstellar. It's like the most emotive Christopher Nolan movie ever, I think. Now, does the fact that you work to the playlist have anything to do with it being... Oh, I work to the Dark Knight playlist. I, I work to the Lord of the Rings playlist more than I do the Interstellar. I just love movie playlists that when I work. It just gets me into the flow. But... The movie for sure is, I think, the best. I think it's my favorite movie of all time. Sheesh. Oh, go like quick aside on people I would love to get on the podcast, McConaughey. I thought you were gonna say Nolan, but both for sure. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if Christopher Nolan does podcasts. He'll do it ours. Not when they're produced like this. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine he comes with like an IMAX yeah, camera yeah, for the like next outside. episode. I, I brought my own camera. <laughs> but no, McConaughey would get sick, and he actually just got into like the info product world out I of know. nowhere. I know. You he see could, that? Mm-hmm. He goes on a lot of podcasts to promote the info product. So he could imagine an Austin trip, McConaughey Rogan. <laughs> Dude, McConaughey is definitely like a potential guest. Like I, we could have McConaughey on in in the next couple of years. That'd be yeah. something. Why not? What's your favorite Nolan movie? The Prestige. The Prestige. That's a good one. Fuck, I was gonna say that. Really? Yeah, yeah. But no, I think you got to go with the classic Dark Knight. Best acting job of all time. The Heath Ledger. But I feel like there's so much, for me at least, recency bias. Like, if I watched Dark Knight today, I'd be like, yo, yeah, for sure it's the best movie. You watch the Prestige, and then you're the like, prestige, the oh, movie of all time. Best movie. That's me with, like, every movie. I always say, oh, it's my favorite. Yeah. I have a new favorite movie, like, every day. Yeah, except for the Marvel movies that went way downhill. Tanked, nah, big I heard, time. I Guardians the new is Guardians is fire, back. though. Yeah, but the last few before that were, like, public service announcements for how you should think. It's like what Ted Lasso is doing now. It sucks. Yeah, yeah, it's tough to watch. It's like okay, let's just let's yeah. just go back to being entertained. All right, last last pop culture thing. Your boy Tucker Carlson got fired from Fox News. Tucker Carlson. Tucker bro. Carlson. So this this brings up an interesting question because I feel like he could just start his own podcast now and be just as big, right? What's the point of having a media company behind you? Is there a point anymore? <laughs> to mm. propel you to the level that gets you to that point? But once you're there... No. No? He is the network, bro. Damn. Portnoy? <laughs> I am the network. I Por- think, like... I mean, there becomes a point when you're not watching Fox for Fox, you're watching Tucker. Or you're watching Hannity. But at the same time, like, there is power in having a media company because the reach goes further than yeah. him. 
So like he's basically his the way he's probably looking at it is, yeah, he could have his own podcast and he could share his message and that's the extent of it. Or he could create his own media network and go out and recruit other you know, media stars that can support or back his message and give different perspectives in 10 X or hundred X his reach without having to do anything differently. There is a report this morning saying him and Elon are potentially going to be partnering on some media company together. How is he? I don't understand Elon, bro. When you hit a point where you can't like, there's no way he can successfully manage all of his stuff at this point. I mean, he's probably just the greatest delegator to ever live. Yeah. Yeah. He's simultaneously managing what? four billion dollar companies at the same time that's dude SpaceX, i would pay Twitter. so much money to just like shadow him for a day i just want to see like when he wakes up what does he do like what does he do throughout the day how do you maintain billions of what's up <laughs> what is he doing in the toilet he tweets yeah he said that i'm pretty sure he said he tweets when he's taking a shit <laughs> twitter on the shitter he's i mean really I active on twitter too i don't i don't know how he does it that's, That's what, what I'm saying. saying. He could probably make like a super high level hire and be done with the whole process in an hour. That's what I want to see is like, what does his day to day look like? That'd be so interesting. I want to shadow him. And imagine you release an NFT. He's like, you shadow me for a day. That'd be sick. Yeah. Go for like five mil. Dude, I, I mean, it would be worth it. I want to shadow Bezos for a day now because it's probably just like. It's probably in up, the gym from when he wakes up, up to he goes to bed. Dude is ripped for no reason. Oh, it's it's there's a great reason. It's like why not get ripped? You That's what I'm saying. He wakes shadow him. He wakes up. He hits the gym. He goes to bed. Like he's probably lifting all day with a different Latina every week. This guy's just he's living, man. <sighs> yeah, Bezos was like, I lost the space war. I'm just gonna get way more girls than Elon. You know now. who's actually super based? <clears throat> Who? Zuckerberg. Dude, I saw a, a video of him. Uh, all right, if grappling. you guys could, if solid. you guys could reach Bezos at Elon level, would you be more like Bezos or more like Elon? Elon. Bezos. I don't know either of them enough, but I feel like I'd be, yeah. yeah, I feel like I'd be like Elon for sure. I'm like more of like the nerd. I think that's really. So like try to it. save the humanity or like get jacked and go on a super yacht with Latinas. Is he trying <laughs> to save humanity though? Elon? Is yeah. that his whole MO? Uh, go to the moon, much. occupy Mars, free media, free press. Make tunnels underground. That's pretty cool, though. He's like the the definition of an entrepreneur. Like yeah. he's solving. Like he's literally taking the biggest problems in the world and and saying, "Yo, let me just be savage enough to try to solve them." Yeah, which I think is sweet. Bezos said it one time with Amazon. Isn't Twitter? Isn't Twitter just like that's cute? That's yeah, cute. He just he took over the world with one company. Uh, yeah, it's cute. <laughs> Who's more like Lex Luthor? You said. I feel like that's Christian. I don't even know who that is. Yeah, who's Lex Luthor? You guys have never seen Superman? I've seen Superman. Is he like the villain or something? Yeah. yeah he's oh, like okay. the evil entrepreneur guy trying to take over the whole world. Oh, okay, okay, okay. That is definitely not me. If I got that rich, I would have no more incentive to take over the world. I'd just chill. Go on <laughs> super yachts with Latinas. Yeah. 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 Okay, so you're Bezos. We, we landed on that. I think... Uh, the most interesting thing, like from an outside perspective and just like our very, very brief career in business so far is, yeah, just how do you get to a point where like you can just have what seems to be an infinite plate and there's just never too much on your plate? Like, do you think there's somebody behind them, like 50 executive assistants who are just like there has actually to be. doing all the work there for them? Like, be. how could he conceive? Oh, yeah. This is why I love this show Succession. Hmm. Just think about like. The character study of Logan Roy. Yeah. He literally had a hundred people just reporting to him and doing things for him. Like, he just sat there and talked to people. Like, he was never working necessarily the way we think of work, like going and answering messages and emails. Like, he's just talking. Like, he's literally, his version of work is sitting in a room with, like, ten people asking him questions and telling him what's on the plate. It's and so then he based. tells them what to do. So and he based. directs them. I'm not sure if it's, like, so accurate to... Like what these guys experience, yeah, kind of but is. I that's why I like, enjoy the like show so much. Billions, like Axe is never making a trade. It's like Mafi, go fucking make some money. Yeah, no, it's a good point. Yeah, I think there is a quote by Chamath or Naval. I get them mixed up all the time. Um, but they're like <laughs> <laughs> it's so racist. I know, aren't it's because yeah, they yeah yeah. <laughs> I'm in the trenches with Lex. Yeah. Chamath Polyapatia. Yeah. 
Um, but one of them was just saying that like their biggest piece of advice for business owners is just to hire people that are smarter than them. And that's it. Chamath has actually never owned a business. So it was probably Naval. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. That's one thing they rip on him on the all in podcast for. Like you've never been a founder. That's crazy. Chamath made a twenty X on the Golden State Warriors, bro. That's the most base thing ever. Oh yeah. And he made yeah. Yeah, I think he was like the first CTO at Facebook. So he's he's worth a couple bill. Another thing about all those guys that they have in common is they're all involved in public companies. Yeah. Is that like a goal of either of yours to get involved with a company that could one day go public? Because I always like grew up thinking that'd be awesome. Just like ringing the bell on the Nasdaq. <laughs> that'd be so cool, man. Like Matt. That would be cool. Um, Bro, I was talking about this to someone. Like, I don't know. It's just such a different opportunity vehicle than we've ever like. I feel like it just uh, makes it way of. less fun. Our niche for of, of like money Twitter and like what we're doing with well, going ascension. public, all the sh- regular like the sh- it just yeah. gets so much more complex. Like I feel like the fun of business is taken out, taken out. It's like what uh, Sam was telling us that one night. It's like you just solve way bigger problems, and there's way bigger yeah, problems. Yeah, it's like oh, I gotta answer to shareholders it. and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at first, it starts you know private. You grow like think of Twitter in the early days. It's probably super fun. That's or what like, I'm saying. It's fun until it goes public, and it's like fuck. So you're saying you you kind of know the end is not all it's made out to be? I would rather exit than go public, I feel like. But going public is kind of like an exit. Yeah. You just hire a CEO under you. True. I don't know. I don't know. I've always thought about it. Yeah, I think if you go public, it means you've effectively solved a really big problem in the world. What even, how do you even, is it your choice? Like, I want to go public now, or like, do you have to get up anointed by... You you Wall elect Street. to the go Illuminati public. comes and blesses you. <laughs> yeah, you, you elect to take your now. company public, and then you have to go through like an application process. It's like you know how you uh, burn NFTs. You just do that with your soul. But you could also NASDAQ. go back. That Elon did that with Twitter. He took him private. Courtney again. went public. We should ask him. Yeah. yeah, I know you have to have like a bank take you public. You have to do this big SEC filing. Underwriting and yeah, a bunch of they stuff. They just hold you up like the Lion King over Wall Street. Oh, that'd be so cool, man. If bro, isn't Twitter like a really small employee base now? Yeah, they cut it down like... We should reply to that amount. dude in our email thread, be like, can we interview Elon? <laughs> oh, he's dope. Shout out to Ethan at Twitter. Is that yeah. his name? Yeah. yeah, Ethan. Legend. Yeah, we dealt with... Uh, <laughs> that's a good segue. We dealt with this one loser who kept trying to extort us. He's been at it for like a year. Get so if you're watching bitch. this, uh, please subscribe. We still need subscribers. Not trying to alienate anybody. <laughs> oh, he's definitely watching this. He's our biggest fan. <laughs> Actually. But it, it did... Like, some 13-year-old Indian dude in his bedroom. We yeah. just dunked on him like Shaq, bro. And just dragged our nuts yeah, all over Yeah, we, we got the W there, I think, unless he comes out with some crazy shit. But that did uh, definitely open my eyes to, like, how dirty the online business game can be. And I guess, like, have you guys had any other encounters other than that with just people trying to scam you, extort you, anything that you can remember? Mm. Oh, dude, this happened all the time in sneaker Twitter. Mm. Like, growing up. That's why I went out of business, bro. Oh, yeah. I tell, tell that story, tell that story all the time. With your, uh, I don't think you told it on the podcast yet. Which one are you thinking of? The one with uh, proxies, right? Yeah, proxies. Um, I've told this, like, the story of, like, my start in entrepreneurship was buying and selling sneakers. That's what got me into it. And then I came across Twitter, and there was, like, a subsect of Twitter, like we have now, Money Twitter, but it was referred to as Sneaker Twitter. Um and basically, I was indoctrinated there, spent a bunch of time there and learned about like bots and proxies and stuff like that. So I started a proxy company, um, long story short. And I was like 16, bro. So I had no idea what I was doing. I got scammed left and right because everyone else, for the most part, was like 16. And like 16-year-olds have no morals. <laughs> uh, 30-year-olds have no morals. But especially 16-year-olds because they have no idea. And yeah, like the, the company was going really good for a while um but the, the way i got out of business is like i had the biggest ever proxy order for like six grand and i, ha- I probably had like twenty five hundred dollars in the company bank account at the time so i got the six grand i spent it on a bunch of shit and then a month later i get a charge back on the six grand and i'm like messaging the kid that ordered it i'm like what the hell like I saw you post about actually getting the sneakers and having success with the proxies. And he's like, oh, yeah, my bad, dude. I used my mom's credit card and she she charged back because she didn't recognize the charge and she's not letting me actually keep it. And I'm like, dude, 
what? <laughs> so like literally the 16 year old kid stole his mom's credit card to buy $6,000 worth of my proxies charged back. I didn't know at the time what a charge back was or how to win it. So I didn't win it and <laughs> just lost all my money because <laughs> some fucking 16 year old dude. Dude, you put me out of business, bro. You literally me. put me out of business. Whoever that mom is, you better be part of our 10%. It was, probably the, C- it was probably the Nike C-suite exec. What are you referring to? Because I feel, I feel like I know the what kid you that front run all the sneaker drops because oh, his yeah, mom yeah. was a Nike. Dude, the exec. sneaker, oh, yeah. bro. I'll tell you, the sneaker sneaker Twitter was scammy, dude. The Wild West. It was the Wild West. That's why legit the checks OG were so crypto. important. Yeah, legit checks weren't even legit, dude. They were <laughs> manipulated. I'm telling you, the guys that scammed me would be on their profile legit check with all the other scammers that scammed me saying legit. They had it was like the mafia. There was definitely a mafia of sneaker Twitter at the time. It was now they're all on money Twitter. Brutal. A <laughs> yeah. lot of them are. I'm not sure the scammers necessarily. I believe those guys probably went out of business at some point, but there's always gonna be bad pe- bad players in any industry. Just gotta just gotta keep doing what you're doing. That's what I was telling you, because we were getting like these emails and these DMs from some guy trying to threaten us with IP manipulation or whatever else. And I'm like, dude, just all he wants is your attention. Just ignore him. Yeah, and then we bodied him. <laughs> RKO. Donked on his head. Donked on him. Yeah. Dude, sneaker Twitter was a fun time. <laughs> I was just watching from the sidelines. I'd get in on a few drops, but classic. Way funnier than money Twitter, in my opinion. Dude. Just like the memes and the characters there. Oh, my God. It was sick, too, because it was, like, super cultural. Like, yeah. It would be, like, Yeezy. And yeah. so everyone would be big on Kanye and then, like, LeBron and Kobe. So that was honestly, like... The ideal. I so wish that in. sneakers were just bought to be worn and not profited on. I just love shoes. I just want to wear shoes. I don't want to pay double because some fucking sixteen year old got three thousand pairs. <laughs> that and was I, me. I want one pair to wear. But at the same time, you have to respect the sixteen year old. Yeah, I respect it, but it's like, bro, I want to buy my own shit. I can't. It's arbitrage, bro. Nike should make a uh, an NFT, and you have to like link your NFT to the website to buy a pair. That'd be lit. You can only have one NFT, so it's like one pair. I feel like they've done a, a pretty good job with the sneakers drops. No. What do you mean? Like they the, said, a, the app stinks, but it's solving the problem that you're looking to solve right now. They said that they have like 16 billion bots on their website a month. But the sneakers drops pretty much negate it. You can only get one per account. And now it's randomized, and like one person out of a no, thousand no, gets a pair. No, sneakers drops, bro, they're, they're... They're corrupt, too? Oh, my God, yeah. There's that. bots that literally... Enter, enter the, the raffle thousands of times. That's why you can't win. Damn, I thought I was sly with just... He's like, my, dude, my it's two, fair. Two, I thought I was sly with like having my brother and two of my sisters do it. No, dude, there's literally sneaker... I had a sneaker ball when they first released, and you enter the raffle. My proudest moment was winning those off-white UNC ones, bro. Never forget that. Sitting in eighth period uh, sports marketing class, I had like the Twitter alerts on for the some guy that announced sneakers drops. He's like, check sneakers, check sneakers. I'm like, all right, fuck it. I open it. It's like UNC Off-White 1 just dropped. I'm like, oh, my God. Entered the line, waited 10 minutes. I was waiting for the you didn't get them. And it said got them, and I, like, fell out of my seat because we were watching a movie in class. I had to, like, excuse myself and run down the hallway. Bro, that, I don't know why day it's my life. super random, but it reminded me of when D. Wade responded to me on Instagram. <laughs> and I was, like, on the bus ride home from a modified <laughs> basketball game, and I was, like, like showing everyone, and they were all, like, they were all, like, this is so fake. And I'm, like, bro, no, it's not. It's literally D. Wade. <laughs> He was, I was like, remember I was so big into like the Lee Nings or what yeah, were they called? Yeah, yeah. Was it Lee Nings? Yeah. Yeah, so like D-Wade, my favorite Team no basketball Team those were fire. Players. Yeah, they were like refle- 3M reflectors. Yeah, yeah. He, he basically like went a way different route than all the other players and partnered with some Chinese sneaker company. And so like I collected all of them. And Jimmy, you couldn't Bu- even get Jimmy them Butler for, wears Lee Nings. Really? Yeah. Remember we had to go through like some weird ass website yeah. to get them? Yeah. That Raimi put us on. But anyways, I bought a ton of them, and I posted, like, a picture of all of them next to each other. I had, like, ten pairs of these shits. And I and I posted them. And then D-Wade commented on the post. And it was like, bro, what, what the heck? I forget. W post? Except something. Nice kicks. He goes, no, he's like, this is the way or something. Like, there was, like, the tagline. <laughs> Did you tag him? Yeah, of course. I tagged him, like, It's probably some leaning executive. <laughs> No, it was D Wade. It's for some sure. intern at Leaning that's supposed to comment under D Wade's account for like 100, <laughs> 100 posts a day. Uh, at least he, at least he made Andre's afternoon. That was a dub. Yeah. You're like, you guys look D Wade. 
<laughs> that was literally me. In your middle school voice? It was on the bus coming home from a modified basketball game. And I was wearing the Lee Nings, and I was... That was that was a day. Yeah. All right. I think it's a... How long have we been going for, Scott? One hour? Guys, what else do we want to talk about? What else do we want to talk about? Do we hit everything on the list? We hit everything on the list. Really? Let me see. Finish the challenge, work-life balance. Oh, you know what? I feel like we've been doing lightning round for the last eight episodes. We've never given our answers. You want to just do that? I don't even know what the questions are, bro. We change it every episode. All right. If you could tweet one thing and it's on a billboard and the whole world sees it, what would it be? Oof. Damn. Christian? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my bad. The whole world sees it? The whole world. Ladies, text me. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? I have to stay on brand. I just tweet my number out. No, I'm kidding. I don't even know, dude. If Michael Jordan sees it, I'd be like, come come on TikTok, Michael Jordan. I would use my tweet to the entire world to get Michael Jordan on TikTok. You're welcome. That's easily the worst answer we've received so far on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let me give Christian a layup. All right, give me your give me your master's meal. <laughs> Dude, it's that's so funny because I've asked it so many times. I've never. I was gonna say that's not even a layup. He's gonna overthink the shit out yeah. of this. Appetizer, some calamari. Yep. Some mozzarella sticks. I thought on- you get one appetizer. You get one appetizer. <laughs> no. You yeah. do whatever you want, bro. This is your no. dinner. Fuck. It's one, bro. Damn. All right, appetizer. The best chips and guac in the world. Entree. The best ribeye with crab and lobster on top of it. And you get to pick three sauces. Side of lobster mac and cheese. Dessert. Tiramisu. And the nicest red wine. Nice. Okay. Solid. Solid. You got any lightning round questions for us? Dinner, any three people. Dead or alive? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go with... My grandpa, Elon, since we've been talking to him, it'd be good to ask him some of the questions that we had earlier. And I think the last one would have to be the greatest basketball player of all time. Jordan doesn't do dinner. D. Wade? No. 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 (laughs) Can you get him really drunk? LeBron James. Get him really drunk so he he doesn't play good. No, that's that's a hard question. I feel like dead and alive should be two different categories. Yeah, because if... Oh, billboard answer? Yeah. If it's dead, it's like Jesus Christ, Abe Lincoln. Dude, I would love to have dinner with George Washington. George Washington. Mm. And I'd be like, bro, we fucked up. (laughs) Everything you said about America is just no two parties. Two parties right away. Yeah, I think actually that's a good reflection. We got to drop the dead part because it's just like too much too hard. of a question. All right, alive three. Alive? Yeah. Donald Trump. No Elon hesitation, Musk. Huh? Oh, Donald Trump for sure. <laughs> like, for sure, Donald Trump. Second would be probably Elon. But like, you could go so many ways with this. I could be like, oh, my dad, my grandpa, my mom. Like, yeah. But I would say, like, outside of family, Donald Trump, Elon Musk, probably Tiger Woods. Forgot Tiger was alive. I would do MJ, Tiger Woods, and John Daly. John, John Daly? Daly. That'd be the sickest dinner of all time, bro. We, it would be in Vegas, and we just go right out to the casino after. That'd be an elite Now night. you're dreaming. I am. I think I'd go... Imagine being at a table with MJ, Tiger Woods, and John Daly playing blackjack. God. That'd be fire. That'd be insane. Speaking of blackjack... Have you been gambling recently? Or are you you taking a little hiatus? Just ride my Warriors. Pause. That's it. What? So riding the Warriors. He's gambling, bro. He bought Pepe. Yeah, that's true. That is that is a form of gambling. It's, defi- going in it's an investment. Coins. Okay, it's an investment. By the yeah. sheer term, it's an investment. Does anybody have a billboard tweet? I don't know what mine would be. I feel like that's a big responsibility. I feel like yours would be inputs over outputs. Yeah, or live, the, live the in the day, measure like the, by the decade. Yeah, I just yeah. do like be kind, 
Everyone's so fucking mean nowadays, Aww. bro. Aww. So cute. What do you mean? If everyone, imagine if everyone was nice to each other. What world? For would our we? seven lady listeners, it would be that He's picture. A sensitive guy. It would be that picture of all the thing, all the floating cars. If we were all nice to each other, look how much we could accomplish. Mm. Grow up. Grow up. That's the definition of growing up. Be kind, bro. Also, Not Christian, you went to Costa Rica. Yeah. How different was that? Oh, dude, I want to buy a house there so bad. Why? Because for a week I didn't hear about. Politics, guns, other uh, Politics hot and guns. news topics. You just wake up, you go to the restaurant, the waiter's like the happiest guy alive, and he probably makes like $2 a day. It's just a very different vibe, bro. You're disconnected from everything. There's one main road in the whole country, one lane. Every side road's dirt. None of the restaurants are labeled. Here's a good question. If you could switch lives with a guy that makes $2 working in the restaurant, would you? Fuck no. <laughs> no. That's a better question, though. <laughs> because it's, it's escapism. Of course you like it. You're yeah. escaping your own reality. No it's, shit. That's why people yeah. like to go on vacations. But I'm saying, like, would you trade situations with someone that actually likes I'm it? I'm not saying I'm escaping my own reality. I'm no saying it's a... Thing but do you really like the place or do you yours? really like the circumstances when you're at the place is, is what I'm getting at. The circumstances, obviously. For sure. So, so you like, would just use as more of a vacation home? Like, that wouldn't be the home base? It'd be like, yeah, whenever I want to go down, have a week there. I, pro I pro For me, I need stimulation. I could probably never live there full time. I would go insane. Yeah. But it's a good reset. It's a great reset. Yeah. The West Falls, you can go to Costa Rica, bro. You're good. Dude, you were the most sunburnt person on the planet. Oh. It's actually disgusting. Oh. My entire back peeled like I was a snake. Yeah, like I thought there was a dog in the apartment for the next two weeks. Oh. You just see skin on the ground. Yeah. It oh, was bad. Nasty, it was dude. bad. It was gross. It was gross. Bad. Andre, you going back to Lebanon anytime soon? Hopefully. In August. In it's August? Still playing. I want to go. You should. It's great. I'll play my New York trip and we'll go right to Lebanon, bro. I'll be based. You should, bro. Do they do they like my kind over there? <laughs> oh my god. Is your pops going? Yeah. Damn. That's the plan. Is um, are we I'll doing Dubai? I'll do Dubai or Lebanon. I'm not doing both. You got to do both because you string them together. What? Dubai is like a two hour flight from Lebanon. I thought we were doing Dubai in November. If you want. Are we doing European summer? What happened to London and Dublin, Jeez, bro? We just went from Lebanon to Dubai to Europe. To yeah, Ireland. I'm down to do that still. Let's plan it after this. July? Yeah. All right. Not July 4th, though. That's, I got to be with my people. True. America. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, I'm so checked out. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, this is uh, this is great. If anybody's here, you're, uh, DM Alleged. us. We'll give you like a free hoodie of Send the help. merch that hasn't, <laughs> the merch that hasn't come out You're yet. seeing us in raw form. Send help, seriously. And you've got another podcast right after this. I'm canceling. You're canceling? Yeah. Right. Sorry, Max. Let's go I, cook some steak. You don't want All me right. on your podcast tonight. Hard cut. Thank you, guys. Love you. See you soon. Uh, if you're actually here watching this right now, we really do mean it when we say we love you. Um, love you, guys. Because that's some true dedication to listen to us in this form, especially. Talk um, away. And yeah, <laughs> I would say... This is probably not the best what? impression of the Stick I'm Talk say, podcast. <laughs> uh, so if you're listening, go check out some of our other episodes. Specifically, let's think what's out there. I think the first episode of Members Lounge was pretty legit. And what was? I guess this is actually a good question for the audience listening. Like, what's your favorite episode that's on the channel so far? Other than Scott, of course. First episode. Mm, I love Brian Moncada's one. Brian Moncada? Um, just like in the moment when we were hosting it, one that was really, really fun that sticks out was Dylan's. Dylan's was really that was fun. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. I feel like that was a good I episode. I like the episode with Grandpa. That was my yeah. favorite. Yeah, that was a legendary one. But uh, yeah, go check out some of those episodes. And uh, we really do. We love you, man. Peace. We love you. I'm out of here. <sighs> Dude, one tweet for the whole world. That's... I'm like...